Hey, good evening, everybody. Bob Dickerson with In the Black uh, coming to you. It's Wednesday. Uh, a happy Wednesday. Glad to be here. Cheers. Cheers. It's, it's, it's after five, so uh, we get a chance to partake. Uh, and, uh, and and we're going to have a really good show tonight, really good conversation coming up with my guest, our district attorney, Danny Carr. Before we get to that, though, uh, just a few things that I want to say and make you aware of. Uh, first of all, thank you all for following me. Thank you for being uh, my friends on Facebook, for following me on Instagram, for, for watching this broadcast on YouTube. You know, I really appreciate it, and I feel the love. Uh, you all just don't know how much it means uh, to have you out there and have you share it and, and and view it. And so all of those things we think or I know are very important. They're very important to me. So thank you, thank you, thank you for doing that. Um, you know, I'm always looking at this computer, wondering what's going on when it starts verifying stuff in the middle of me talking. So hopefully that's just going to be a thing that's going to go away and and none of you see it i know you don't i, I want to mention uh, a couple of things uh before we we get into the show tonight um we we have coming up on next tuesday the 18th the building alabama reinvestment annual conference it's our 11th annual conference now uh, the Community Reinvestment Act is very important. It's the law that says that banks will provide their products and services to all communities, including low and moderate income communities, urban communities, rural communities. And, and But it's very important that we develop an understanding about CRA and that we develop organizations that can work with banks to benefit from the Community Reinvestment Act. You can learn more about CRA, you can hear from nonprofit organizations that are doing great work. You can hear from banks about their partnership opportunities, and you can get that all free of charge. It's buildalabama.org website. You can register. It's free. It's next Tuesday, starting at 9 o'clock, 9 until 11.30 on next Tuesday. So, you know, and I know and it's a Zoom call. It's virtual. You don't have to pay anything. You don't have to go anywhere. So, uh, so if you get an opportunity to do that, last week uh, we had the National Community Reinvestment Coalition's conference, and since we're doing stuff virtual, uh, that is still it's not the conference is over, but some of the sessions are still ongoing. And I just got to give a shout out to one of our local owners, Alicia Jacob of Healing Hands, was uh, featured on an entrepreneurial panel yesterday, a panel that talked about business owners and how they pivoted uh, as a result of the COVID-19 shutdown. And, and you know, even though the shutdown was terrible and a lot of folks lost jobs and businesses were hurt, some folks were able to pivot, pivot well enough that some people actually did better, gain more revenue. And so listening to those stories, I think is very important. And so you can get that on demand and you can go on the NCRC website. That is ncrc.org, ncrc.org, and, and, and check that out. So hello to, to Sean Thurman, hello to Sharon, and I'm gonna go ahead and right now welcome Mr. Danny Carr, the district attorney for Jefferson County to end the black with Bob Dickerson. DA Carr, how are you doing? Hey, Bob, I'm doing good, man. Glad to be here. Thanks for having me. Well, listen, listen, thank you for, for being on. Now, listen, first things first. All right. Because we're only, we're, we're just a couple of days past Mother's Day. Right. And I got to make sure, I got to make sure. Um, and, and I think most of you know Regina Carr, who was a longtime educator in the Birmingham school system. Right. Uh, she was the former principal at Winona. Now, I didn't go to Winona. I went to Westfield, but my brother and my sister went to Winona and my dad went to Winona. And so I know a lot of Winona people. But anyway, I just got to give a shout out to your mom. Hey, man. Hey, let me tell you, I appreciate it. You know, she's watching. I told her I would be on your show. I had to show her how to get on. And so she texted me and said she's watching. And I told her you would give a shout out. And she said, Bob, no better. He know he better give me a shout out. <laughs> I'm not going to get in trouble. 
with your mother. I promise you, I am not going to do that. And, uh, you know, but but it's good when you think about folks who have dedicated their lives to educating young people, how right. important it is. And so, uh, Regina Carr, how you doing? Hats off to you. Uh, a belated Happy Mother's Day, but I know you had to go. Oh, yeah, she did. Trust me, she uh, did. <laughs> so, so, listen, I, I want to talk about a few things today. And, and first and foremost, you know, I want to delve just a bit into making sure that the audience knows what a district attorney does now you because you know we will all watch law and order and uh right. kojak and I've, I've been watching that on you know on uh on the fire tv right but but make sure let's make sure we understand what the job entails and what's the role of the district attorney well you know and that's a great question you know oftentimes i tell people you know these television shows law and order um, you know, I just remember New York Undercover, all these different shows that portray um, DA's office and lawyers and things of that nature. It's, it's Hollywood. So they have to create this ending. But in real life, the DA basically is the, key, is the gatekeeper of the criminal justice system. And what I mean by that, that main portion for DA's is in the courtroom. Um, and I often t explain it this way. A DA's job is bifurcated, meaning that the innocent doesn't suffer, but also that the guilty doesn't go free. You have an obligation to vote, which is unique. And um, your job is to make sure at the end of the day that um, based on a given set of facts and applying that law, that a certain result occurs. Now, it doesn't work that way all the time because there are so many factors that are involved. But a real life example is being a DA is like being a referee of a game. You make a decision, the home crowd will cheer and the visitors are going to boo. You have to be comfortable being uncomfortable. But your job at the end of the day is to make sure that justice occurs in whatever way justice flows. And justice doesn't mean that necessarily the most popular result occurs. It's just that the right result occurs and that is not influenced by political push or anything like that. Your job is just do what's right. You know, I, 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 that, and that's a great explanation. And I hope people heard that. I, I like the uh, the comparison to a referee. You know, I referee a long time. You're absolutely right. You're gonna make somebody mad. I knew you would appreciate that one, but it's oh, true. But but you but you're making the right call. And of course, being the 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 DA is also an elected official. Now, you know, one who anybody who knows you or looks at your bio understands that you've been involved in community service for a long time before. You, you you got to be DA. So, I mean, that's, I, I'd like for you to talk a bit about that because you've been on a lot of boards and have given back way way before you decided to, to run for office. Right. You know, Bob, I, you know, I've been in this community, obviously born and raised in Ansley. So I'm from this community, from one of the underserved communities. Well, statistics say that a guy like me should not be the DA of the largest county in the largest DA's office in the state from a single parent home. However, um, for me, what people don't know is in July of this year will be my 20th year at the DA's office. So in two more months, month and a half, I will be celebrating my 20th year here, 17 years as an assistant, three years as um, an elected. But before that as well, some of the other things that I've done is, you know, people don't know I've taught at various schools. I've taught at Miles Law School. I've taught at Jeff State. Um, I've taught at Birmingham School of Law. I even taught at the University of South Carolina. And even more recently, I've taught at John Jay College of Criminal Justice in New York City. So I've been around teaching. Um, I've been to a various amount of schools within the community to talk to kids about the ramifications of their actions. Because I believe that as DA, if my job is to hold you accountable for the actions or the criminal acts you commit, then I think a more where the rubber really meets the road and where the really hard work comes is getting out of the community and trying to stop people from being in the system as well. So um, I view my job a little different than most people. I think I have an obligation to get out there and help young people who are similarly situated like me understand that this is not the route they want to take before they take that route. Hey, hey, I, you know, you were doing a lot of teaching. <laughs> you were. <laughs> oh, no, yeah. I, I guess, do you meet yourself sometimes when you running so fast? I tell you, it, it, it was difficult. And people ask me, how did you teach 
at the University of South Carolina. Well, it was um, on campus there, and it was a school called the National Advocacy Center. And what I was doing, even as an assistant, Bob, 10 years ago, I was teaching prosecutors from all over the country. They would come to South Carolina for a week, and I would teach them all phases of trial advocacy, closing argument, opening statement, cross-examination, expert witnesses, all the things that prosecutors have to learn and do in their daily routine. I was teaching young prosecutors from all over the country, and um, it was re very rewarding. And um, at the same time, who would ever thought a young guy like me from um, Birmingham, from Inslee, would have that opportunity. So it was very rewarding. And um, I would like to continue to do it, but right now my schedule is very busy and I can't. Well, well, I think we're fortunate to have you because, because you're so real and so connected uh, to, to the entire community and, right. and, and, and so giving. I, I think that's real, really important. So I know uh, three years as, as DA, uh, I'm, I'm sure you've had some challenges. I'm sure you've had some victories and some, right. some special moments and, and special right. things. Can, can I talk to the audience about some of those challenges or victories or special things that you that just jump out to you? You know, uh, one of the really, really special things I tell people all the time is that the unique thing about being the DA and being in this office is that your one job is to do what's right. And sometimes people can see that as being of um, ethics within yourself to do what's right, even when unpopular. For instance, you know, we've had situations where um, a person may have been charged with a crime and shouldn't have been charged with a crime. And then based on that, we've made the decision that, hey, this is the wrong person. We need to let that person go. And then sometimes that may not be popular, but it's the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. I've had a mother hug my neck and not let me go and look at me and say, I want you to go home and tell your mother, thank you for having you. Because my daughter would not have had a voice. Her young daughter was raped um, mm -hmm. by the stepdad um, repeatedly. And um, we took the case and I took the case to trial and she hugged me and she cried and she said, thank you. And she said, I want you to just tell your mom, thank you. My daughter wouldn't have had a voice without you. So there are a lot of things that go on within the being the DA and within the DA's office that a lot of people don't hear about. You often hear about the murders and all that stuff. But what you don't hear about are some of the success stories like some of the people who have been in jail for life without parole on drug cases. They hadn't hurt anybody. They hadn't killed anybody, but they got a life without parole sentence. And some of those individuals, a, a lady named Geneva Cooley, for your listeners, they can Google that name, Geneva Cooley. You'll see where, um, you know, this office and myself was very instrumental in getting her from under that life without parole sentence. And now she's at home back in New York with her grandkids. She served almost 20 years here on a drug case. So all those things are things that you get a chance to um, help people along the way, hold people accountable. I always tell people, you can be tough on crime, but still be smart on crime. So there are a lot of things that we've done here um, and that we continue to do, Bob, that I think is going to change the landscape of the DA's office and hopefully change the dynamics of the DA's office around the state. You know, you know, one of the things that uh, I, I've noted that you've uh, implemented is a second chance job fair right. uh, for, for, for people that are returning. And, that, and I think that is so important. Because you know, once a person has paid their debt, we shouldn't keep making them pay back, you know, by sort of foreclosing opportunities. So, absolutely. And I could tell you about we started this in 2019, we did the first one at the Boutwell. And it's interesting we're having this conversation because <clears throat> next Tuesday on May 18th, we're doing another one from 10 to 2 at the Boutwell Auditorium. We're going to have over 500 jobs available, real mm -hmm. jobs with very, very, very great living wages career opportunities for people who have been touched by the criminal justice system. And, all, and that's why we call it second chance. Mm -hmm. All the employers who have agreed to come know that their target audience are people who have felonies, people who have, may, have maybe have some transgressions before, but have had difficulties becoming productive members of society. So they're gonna be there, they're gonna be willing to hire them that day and give them meaningful employment. And I tell people, if you wanna fight crime one of the ways you do it 
it's changing the trajectory of a person's life. Those people that can then become productive members of society. They can become fathers, husbands, productive members, and be our credible messenger in our communities to tell young people that you don't want to take the road that I took. And uh, we've had great success with this. Uh, we're going to continue to do it even after this, but we will have it at the Boutwell, um, went Tuesday, May 18th, from 10 to 2, and uh, we have plenty of jobs available, and hopefully people will take advantage of it. See, that's great. That, you know, that that is a justice system when when you when you look at it like that. I know Brian Stevenson, um, the head of the Equal Justice Initiative, right. makes a statement. He says that the opposite of poverty isn't wealth, that the opposite of poverty is justice. And the more justice we can have in our society, the better off we're all going to be. And so, you know, absolutely. my hat's off to you for, for being I, I, aggressive. No, I appreciate that. I mean, I, I agree with that. I believe human dignity is a human right. And sometimes people having jobs and not just being labeled and being pushed aside. They paid their debts to society. Now let's make sure that we attack it holistically, even from this office. And people told me I was crazy being the DA and getting involved in something like that. But I felt from the bottom of my heart, Bob, that you know, a guy like me, I, I owe that to the community as well, to use my platform creatively to help other people. And um, that's what we're trying to do with this Second Chance Job Fair. So uh, I couldn't have a conversation with you without uh, pivoting a little bit and discussing some of the, uh, I, you know, sometimes we say the elephant in the room. Well, it's an elephant right. in the room. Uh, with right. what's happening on, on the national scene, you know, uh, I, I noted that in Georgia, just, I guess, early this week, the citizens arrest laws are, are, are being taken off the books. That's what the folks used to as an excuse to kill uh, Ahmad Aubrey. And, and of course, we just came from that Derek Chauvin trial, you know, and, and, and then the, the heat in Elizabeth City, North Carolina over Andrew Brown. Talk a bit about what's happening on the national scene from your perspective. Well, you know, people, the one thing that people talk about all the time, number one is when you look at what's going on nationally and you look at, um, how laws are implemented, where they come from, what's the legislative purpose behind those laws. So one of the things that's been one of the biggest topics is when you talk about self-defense. Um, and people often ask me about that, stand your ground. Mm -hmm. What is that? What is so significant about that? The law states generally that you can use even, you can use deadly physical force if you reasonably believe deadly physical force is about to be used on you or others meaning that you can even use it to save another person's life if it's reasonable under the circumstances. Now, why is that important? Stand your ground means that you don't. You used to have a duty to retreat. The people didn't know that. If you can safely retreat, the law said that you couldn't resort to force. You had to retreat. But now you don't. If you're at work, you don't have a duty to retreat. Uh, if you're at home, you don't have a duty to retreat. But all of those laws that we're talking about, you know, sometimes they create what's called a powder keg. Because one of the major questions, Bob, is this. The law also says that if a person is about to commit an assault on you, that you can use deadly physical force. So if a person punches you in the face, can't you just turn around and just shoot? Well, the law says that if they're about to commit or is committing an assault, that it can technically be a justifiable to use deadly physical force. So there are a lot of unanswered questions, but what we do know in general is that based on a given set of facts, based on a given set of circumstances, and applying the law, hopefully you come to what a reasonable person would conclude what that reasonable um, final analysis should be. But, you know, in the Derek Chauvin situation, the man was handcuffed on the ground, begging for his life, no longer a threat to anyone. So was it reasonable to continue to use force against a man who was no longer a threat? That's one of the thresholds. Is he a threat? No, he was not a threat. And I and I said this publicly. I thought that you know that verdict took a long time based on the fact it took you know several hours, almost another day, to a man who was no longer a threat. So again, all these things, there's no right or wrong answer, Bob. But what you have to do is 
look at a set of facts, apply the law, but what you can't do, and I tell people this all the time, I don't have the luxury of emotions. I have the burden of proof. Right. Right. So at the DA, you know, you don't have the luxury of emotions. Emotions is not a part of it. It is what does the fact show? What is the law? And you apply that to and, and come up with your conclusion. So when you, you look at um, policing and, you know, the after George Floyd, of course, it was, you know, this band police departments and I, I you know that, that that's kind of scary in itself right uh, to, to think about that but but do you think it that we can is it a training issue that sometimes we we've got to grapple with or, well, or tell me what you think that's, I, a great, that's a great question bob that's a great question i would say this and uh nobody's ever asked me this but but here's what i food for thought when you think about training in any business, anything historically, it has always been kind of the old guards that train the new people, mm -hmm. people that's been around the longest. But times have changed, circumstances have changed. So I think having the old guards train new recruits, even in law enforcement, may not be the best route to take. I think you also have to look at training them in de-escalation as well. That's one of the things that I think when law enforcement shows up, you know, some one of the things on the forefront of their mind should be how to de-escalate some as well. And if they can de-escalate it. Now, you don't want to put that burden on them if people got weapons in their hand and people may be shooting. That. That's not realistic, you know, because law enforcement officers want to go home as well. But I'm talking about getting to a certain scene, de-escalating the situation, and hopefully everybody walks away and goes home. But for me, I truly think when you're talking about defunding the police. And I think that's where you're going to defund it. For me, here's what I think would need to happen, Bob. I think when you talk about defund, I think the terminology is wrong. I think what they need to talk about is pivoting um, some resources and provide more. We're asking the police to be a counselor, to be a nurse, to be a mental health expert, all of these things, while at a scene that could be hostile. Mm -hmm. So what we need to do is be able to have professionals to be able to also work and coincide with them to maybe when they show up at a scene where a guy has a mental illness but he is not threatening anyone that you can get an expert to show up with them and try to de-escalate it once it's safe now once it's safe we don't want once it's safe but we have to look at creatively seeing how we can provide those wraparound services to help law enforcement officers um, be more effective and not just kind of be out there being asked to do all these different things when in essence they're really trained to serve and protect and at the forefront of their minds and our minds we need to make sure that they're serving and protecting and then allow the other wraparound services to do their part as well thank you thank you so so we have danny carr the district attorney of, for jefferson county our guest danny i really appreciate you taking your time out i, I one more thing before right. i go i got okay. I get, because you know, I think this can be important. If there's a young man, young woman, uh, young person who looks at you and says, that's who I want to be. That's what I want to be. Give, give them some advice as to what steps they need to take uh, to be able to walk in your shoes at some point in their future. Let me first start by saying this. I, I, and, I, and I'm glad you asked me that because I want people to understand this. I'm from the same community. I'm from Inslee, single parent home, but I had a strong mother at home. I had a mother that didn't take any excuses. I had a mother that would not allow me to, to, to feel sorry for myself and allow the circumstances to dictate my future. She wouldn't do it. She always told me ability, motivation, and attitude. What she meant by that, and I remember to this day, Bob, what she meant was ability is what you're capable of doing, right? Motivation determines what you do, and then attitude determines how well you do it. Right. And she always told me that. And she always told me that, son, you can be whatever you want to be, but you have to do take the road less travel. That means you got to make sacrifices. That means you got to have courage. That means you got to put yourself in a position where you can then dictate what you want to be in the future. But it's up to you. Don't let anybody tell you that you can't be what you want to be because you went to a historically black college, because you went to a law school at Miles College that nobody would ever think, Bob, that a guy from Inslee who went to Miles College 
would interview people that went to Princeton, interview someone that went to the University of Michigan, interview those individuals. But for me, I just felt like I always said, you know, you know, God, you don't have to remove my mountains. Just give me the strength to climb. And for me, I always say to myself, and I always tell young people, do not allow your circumstance to dictate your future, but you have to make the necessary sacrifices and you have to be willing to have the right, to have the ability, the motivation and attitude, and you can be whatever you want to be. And that's what I tell young people today. Use me as motivation. Come talk to me if you want to. But at the end of the day, I'm a boy from Ensley from a single parent home, no excuses. You can use me each and every day to motivate yourself to reach this level as well. Danny, thank you. Man, thank you so much for being part of, of my show today. I really appreciate you taking the time. I really appreciate what you shared. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this is somebody who has really given, given back, E-N, and giving back. Uh, uh, that's in the current sense. Thank you again, and good luck to you. Uh, we love you, brother. Thank you. Hey, Bob, thank you for everything, man. I just want to say this, too. Thank you for being, you know, a motivating figure for me. You know, you don't. sometimes people don't know who's watching. And I've watched you over the years. I've watched how you carry yourself. Sometimes you've had conversations with me when you didn't have to, and you've motivated me. So I just want to tell you this, listeners, thank you. When people are not around, and you don't get the pats on the back, but you still take time out for young men like me, so I appreciate you, and I thank you, and keep up the good work in our communities, man. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Dan. Thank yes, you, sir. So All, All right. right. All right. All right, and yeah, that was District Attorney Danny Carr. Great conversation. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you'll share it with with some young people because, uh, you know, we can all emulate people who have succeeded, and not just in terms of getting a position, but succeeded in terms of who they are and what they do and how they give back to their community. So we're really proud uh, to have had him as a guest and proud to see him uh, ascending to the position that he's in. And, and, and hopefully this won't be the last, but well, certainly he's gonna stay in that position, but he may do even bigger and better things. So, so we really appreciate it. I want to mention to you once again, before we get out of here, uh, that on the 18th, which is next Tuesday, uh, for free, you don't have to pay anything. You just have to go on the buildingalabama.org website, building, www.buildingalabama.org, and you can register for the Building Alabama 11th Annual Conference. It's virtual, it's free of charge, Learn more about the Community Reinvestment Act and how it might affect you and your community. The more we know about it, the more we're able to use it. So I want to make sure you do that. Be sure to tell your friends and, and colleagues to join us uh, each Wednesday at six o'clock on Facebook Live and on my YouTube channel. We're going to continue to have interesting con conversations about things that impact our community. And then you can hear me talk about stuff that I I think, uh, you know, that things that are happening in the political world, things that are happening in the business world, things that are happening all over the world. And we got a lot of stuff happening, you know, especially in politics and in business and so forth. So so please keep that in mind. Uh, be sure to check out my blog at bobdickerson.com. Uh, not really sure what I'm going to write about this week, but something will come to me hopefully in the next day or so. Uh, Thank you all. I love you. Talk to you soon. Have a great rest of your week. This is Bob Dickerson with In the Black.